If you look at poll after poll after poll over time, Americans tend to vote for president on domestic issues, not international ones. Is this sufficient to really raise you above the pack, as it were? It, while it's not sufficient, it's important to remember what John F. Kennedy once said. The job is not to tell people what they want to hear. The job is to tell people what they need to hear. Let's take climate change. If we do pass the new Green Deal within a decade, as some wants to, to bring down climate change, it, David, it doesn't matter. Because it's all of the world doing it or nothing, because that's only 15 percent of the reduction in global, uh, global emissions that are needed to be brought to zero before that catastrophic threat explodes on us. Take Saudi Arabia. It will use as much energy to power its air conditioning 10 years from now when the New Green Deal, some want to go into effect as it exports in oil today. 194 nations aren't doing what they committed to in the Paris Accord. You better have somebody who can protect our American dream by understanding that America's greatest power is its power to convene, to bring together nations and peoples of the world for a common cause that serves us all. And, like I did in my nearly two to one Republican district, with, an with a very progressive, very progressive voting record, was able to be reelected without spending one dime of the three million I raised for that, that effort. That's why I brought both of them up. Someone who's accountable but understands whether it's climate change or an illiberal might makes right regime that's arising, like China, that is actually, as the prime minister of Malaysia has said, is the new colonial power, enslaving nations with predatory debt, so they have to give it ports like Sri Lanka and Djibouti did for naval bases. We better understand that someone's out there beginning to contract a way of life. And that's why I'm living in Iowa and deployed here to make sure I let all Americans know that. We have a man in the Oval Office right now, the job that you'd like to take, who uh, campaigned and many believe won by talking to people who felt disenfranchised in their jobs, in, their, in the economy, in their home lives, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, in Wisconsin. What particular message do you have to those people that says, I will do better for you and your families economically and day-to-day -day life than President Trump has done? It's because, again, accountability, doing what's right for people above party. So, for example, when I walked 422 miles across Pennsylvania and held an open town hall, Republicans and Democrats alike, at each day of that 36-day walk, I made sure that they understood the policies that I would support them. For example, training for a lifetime. People talk about debt for the college youth, and I understand that. And I have two proposals to reduce it, because the federal government is making $127 billion today because they faced, put the loan rate on the wrong 10-year Treasury bond, so they're going to make $127 billion pro profit. But training for a lifetime, think about it. We spend the least, the least of any developed nation on labor training, the men and women you just spoke about. So when a coal miner loses his job, where's the training? We spend 0.001% of a gross domestic product. We're not like Germany and others that it do what the United States military does. When a man or woman loses their job because the F-16 goes away, we send them to the largest Air Force Academy, largest community college in the nation, the U.S. Air Force Community College. They learn the upgraded skill and they go to the F-22. We need to do that for those workers. So when you brought back those trillions of dollars, Mr. Trump, that were overseas for corporations that already had $5 trillion they weren't investing here in America, they went to stock dividends, they went to buybacks. Right. And right. so here's what I want to do is work for them for what is our homeland defense, education and training for a lifetime to acquire and reacquire a skill. Joe, I'm mindful of the fact that as we have this discussion, it is the eve of July 4th, uh, when we celebrate our nation's birthday. We have heard from the president just yesterday that there's going to be a big military extravaganza parade on the mall. As a veteran, as somebody who served as a vice admiral in war, as someone who served in the White House, what do you think of that? I think there is no, there is no one you can honor higher than a veteran. But I will tell you this. What stands in my mind as I read about that over these past weeks as it was going to happen is I remember George Washington, that when the Revolutionary War was over, the man who had actually been commander in chief, the most powerful man in this new Americas, he asked that if he could come to con the Continental Congress and hand over to the Continental Congress in public his sword to be owned, kept by the Congress. 
to demonstrate that in this new America that we were to have, unlike England and other places where we, many of us had come from, that we were to be underneath the legislative power and never again would we have a powerful man in the world taking over, at least here in America, because it was military. That was an important symbol this president should remember. And you know what? George, King George of England, when he heard about it, said, that is the most remarkable man who has ever existed. Mm -hmm. And that's what we should remember about our military. We are underneath and we serve, and we should not look like it's all about the military on July 4th. We are servants.